and welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast, everything found on the website, is covered by BIPCOT, no government license, so as reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can, more, you can learn more by visiting bipcot.org. So one quick note before we get into this episode. Uh, I just received a big shipment of books from Amazon, so everything we have for sale uh, on Liberty Intertype Publications is ready to ship. If you're looking to learn more about self-liberation, please do consider placing an order. Just visit libertyintertype.com and take 10% off by using coupon code SELFLIBERATE. Uh, Bitcoin is accepted and preferred, and uh, we don't accept uh, altcoins. I had one person uh, you know, reach out to me and offer, uh, you know, appreciate the order and all. Um, but uh, now that shape sh shapeshift isn't uh, well, shapeshift is there, but they want to know like uh, all my private information. That's just not going to happen. So it's not as easy to uh, to convert into Bitcoin as it was before. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, if you'd rather purchase on Amazon, uh, you can find that link in the book description. Uh, but you won't get any cool stickers uh, or business cards with your order. Again, that's libertyintertech.com. Use coupon code SELFLIBERATE for ten percent off your entire order. So today's episode is number 52 of the main podcast feed and the ninth in our Crypto Anarchism series. Yes, we're finally back at it uh, The main that's for the uh, main podcast feed. It's uh, been a little while. And uh, for this special episode, I'm joined by a good friend, Matthew Raymer. Uh, Matthew is an American expat living in the Philippines, uh, the founder of Anomalous Design, a consulting business in the field of uh, programming and development. Uh, he is the co-founder of ContentSafe.co uh, with my other uh, good friend, Daryl Becker, and he is the lead developer for Darklands, a project which you should be familiar with uh, if you're a regular listener or viewer uh, of this podcast. So we're going to talk about all of those things uh, this evening. Well, I guess uh, for you, Matthew, uh, it's morning, but uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to the uh, Vani podcast. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, how are you doing today? Doing great. Beautiful weather here. Hey, uh, good uh, nice to find talk to you on the show. Right, it's been a long time coming, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Why so, what, where do you want to? Oh, over here now. <laughs> oh, right, right. And it does look like show, uh, Skype showing poor connection. That's uh, unfortunate. But uh, okay, disappeared. We'll just continue rolling as a uh, yeah. Uh, continue rolling. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, cool. uh, but yeah, um, so since you may be a, a new face or a voice, uh, for my audience, uh, why don't you start by telling us a little, a little about, uh, who you are and, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what you do. Well, you know, <clears throat> I've had a pretty eclectic, uh, life. Uh, I'm 49 now and uh, I've done a lot of stuff over the last 49 years. Uh, just to, not to spend too much time on that, but. I started out in high school interested in music, so I studied music in high school for like six years, but at the end of it, I decided I didn't want to be a musician, so I, uh, and I really wasn't that good of a musician, and I uh, got interested in the sciences, uh, got really passionate about computer science and math and physics, so I got a bachelor's degree in all three of them, uh, you know, uh, like really super geek i had one of my department heads call me an uber geek <laughs> and i went to graduate school in physics and i tell you honestly it burned out uh, i had very good grades uh but after a year in graduate school i said you know i, I don't want to do this the rest of my life so i i was in north carolina raleigh at the time and i had met some friends and one of them had married a filipina and he was like, hey, man, I'll introduce you to some ladies that are friends with my wife. And uh, at the time, it was just like, ah, you know, pen pal, fine, because this is pre, that was just right at the beginning of the commercial internet. It was like 1993, 1992. And um, I said, yeah, pen pals, you know, I'm not interested in anything. I'm not interested in married or anything like that. So... I saved up my money, though, to go visit her and then to go visit my friend who migrated to Hong Kong. And I met the lady, I fell in love with her, proposed almost immediately. <laughs> and yeah, I was like almost immediately, even though I told myself I wasn't going to do that. And 90, let's see, that would have been 94 that I did that. 95, I got married here in the Philippines. I had a I had transitioned from my PhD in physics to getting a master's in computer science because everybody told me, don't do anything crazy. Finish a degree before you, you, you know, you go do anything crazy. And 
thankfully I did that because even though now I have a very skeptical opinion about degrees themselves, I have to admit most of the world has some sort of opinion about them and they generally prefer you if you have some sort of degree. Sure. So I got the masters, right? And my wife and I had said, ah, we're just going to migrate back to the U.S. So whenever I went in 96 to wait with her, I came over here and waited with her. I just didn't want her to be alone. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny, after a few months, we got the, the notification from the embassy to get her green card. And we said, screw it. We're not going back to the States. Why would we want to live there? And I spent, well, I had two kids, uh, uh, spent time just moving from this to that living off the generosity of friends and family for a few years. And about 99, I, I, I met a local guy who set up a business here. And that didn't work out very well, even though he and I are still really good friends. Um, the, start running a business out of the Philippines itself and trying to make money here is impossible. For, for, for a foreigner, it's next to impossible. Hmm. Uh, too many obstacles uh but i started doing things with companies outside of the philippines and that is viable live here make money abroad that works well let's fast forward because a lot of stuff happened over the since like 2000 2001 i got reintroduced to some classmates who work for some big companies in the States. They started giving me gigs, which led me to doing contracts in Europe. And I've, over that time, accumulated a group of people, co contractors that I really respect. They're very talented. And we try to always push the envelope in what we do. So in 2007, we formed a US LLC called Anomalous Design. And that's our, our company that we represent for our big projects. I still do some freelance stuff. And, and I do want to talk about that today because I have some sure. very dark, dark pilled opinions about freelance companies. Uh, but I do believe that freelancing is a viable thing for someone who is practicing on it. But I, I do think that if you're going to go with corporate freelance sites, you really have to be uh understanding of just how dis you know disproportionate that that relationship is uh so that's why dark lance came to my mind and i i know that whenever we were first talking about vanu coin i had brought up dark lance as, mm -hmm. a, as a pet idea, right and, and i'm glad that man you ran with it you've got a great white paper uh i know mark wood uh is it wood or woods wood singular yeah yeah mark wood Correct. Yeah. Uh, mark wood did a fantastic additions to that i really love the his his old idea which was meta market right correct yep meta market yeah uh fantastic concept and integrating that into dark lance i think plus scuttle bot scuttle bug it is a great combination um so right now uh, I've been trying over the last three to four years to build up my own sort of in-house businesses. So part of that's been strategically partnering with other companies to build projects for them on a profit share basis. So like I've got one company in Iceland that we're partnered with that uh, they do like Coupons. In fact, it's called coupons.is. Q P O N S dot I S. They're a partner of ours. Okay. Uh, we will be launching sometime in the next two to three months while we go through the beta phase. Uh, I've also partnered with a company in Greece called football dot IQ dot EU. But that partnership is uh, still under negotiation, let's say, and I'm not sure how far along it will get. Uh, myself, as you said at the beginning of the show, content safe is mine and Daryl's baby. 
Uh, this was another idea that was spawned out of listening to alt media for the last seven to ten years. Uh, the idea that someone needed to step into the gap and aid content creators and content distributors to join the two together through a service that would enable and perhaps address many of the problems that exist in the content creation world. So for one, if I'm a content creator, I know that there are dozens of these other sites I could distribute my video content to, but I don't have time to do it. So what we've done, and this is live already, uh, what we've done is create a system that a Peer, a, excuse me, a, um, a, it's a server-based system. It's not peer-to-peer, -peer, at least not yet. And it will allow or assist a content creator to distribute his video or an audio content to a variety of different platforms. Uh, we're not done yet. Uh, we still got a lot of things we want to add, but I do believe we're at a point where we can start accepting customers. So at Very present, good. we can distribute um, uh, YouTube, it, let's say that you're a content creator who primarily up, uploads to YouTube. And you can up, you continue working the way you normally do. You distribute to YouTube and it redistributes to uh, DTube and BitChute. We are also working on modules to redistribute to uh, Vimeo and uh, Facebook, Twitter, Oh, and I, we also have a module that if you run a WordPress blog, it can post the blog entry automatically when you really? upload to YouTube. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And that's done. Yeah, done already. Um, but we've got more plans. We have more plans for that. Uh, we, we've been talking with um, uh, Freedoms Phoenix, and they are interested in uh, perhaps helping us to build an IPFS infrastructure because what, they, what they're advocating, and I think they're correct, I've told Ernest this, that I believe he's spot on, perfectly correct, that what people need to be doing is publishing the IPFS, interplanetary file system, and then using that as a off-grid, so to speak, distribution network. And that way, nobody can take it down, really. As long as there are nodes up, it's up. Right, and just uh, just so for, would... for the listeners who may not be, I don't think we've talked about IPFS here on the Crypto Anarchism series yet. It might have come up, uh, you know, in passing here and there. But so what's uh, so how, how does how does that work? Obviously, it's a, a decentralized way. Um, for for those who are familiar with DTube, um, it's not. I think I don't think DTube is on. Um, I think they're. Oh, I don't. I don't. Remember. Or maybe that's uh, D Live. But anyway, uh, DTube utilized IPFS. So when you uploaded to uploaded to DTube, it would. Um, that's where it was going. It was IPFS. I'm sure you guys saw if you uploaded videos there. Um, but uh, but uh, I guess tell the listeners a little about uh, how that works and uh, uh, yeah, uh, a little how well, it works. It, I assume that most everybody knows about uh, Bitcoin, right? We can assume that. Sure. IPFS is essentially the same technology as BitTorrent, but it's evolved. Uh, it's evolved where now instead of just remembering a static block or, or file or, or maybe a folder, it, it can actually be dynamically written to. So you can publish addresses for folders and you can add files to them at will. This is like be. That's why it's called interplanetary file system instead of file sharing. Oh, okay. It's game changer. Now, I will say, despite all the positive buzz in the crypto anarchist uh, you know, movement about this, IPFS is still baby technology. It, it's, not, it's not fully mature yet. And uh, while I advocate people adopting it now, I think everyone needs to understand that there are some bottlenecks in it. it. It doesn't really have as quick a distribution as we would like it to have. DTube has done really great. But in order for IPFS to work, we're going to have to have more people devoting more disk and bandwidth to evolve the, the network, or as they would call it, the swarm. Uh, and that's where we're stepping in as well. We've been... We've been talking to some of our partners 
I've got partners in Europe. I've got partners in uh, the U.S. that are willing to donate, or not donate, but be compensated for uh, pin, what's called pinning. Uh, let me back up a second and explain how IPFS works as far as sharing. The way IPFS works is if I were to share a link to you, it would download the contents of that link onto your local drive and it would begin sharing it. But as the demand for that link lessened and lessened and lessened, less people were asking for it, it would eventually delete it from your local system to conserve disk space. Hmm. If you wanted to make it more permanent, you do what they call pinning. You pin the file and it stays there and it doesn't get deleted until you unpin it. What we are trying to build is a network where people could pay us to pin. And if they wanted to say push a video for a few weeks, right? And they wanted to keep it available or if it was what some, some people call evergreen content that they wanted it up forever, right? they could pay us to post pin it. And, we want to try to create a distributed network where we have pinning in the U.S., pinning in Europe, and pinning in Asia. And that way we could sell space that way. And it would keep the network growing. It would also aid content safe in its further development. Right. It's a win-win-win. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a win-win-win. And I'm really getting in a good position because, oh, I forgot to mention one of my other partner companies is a company called ProCryptos which is an inter-exchange private anonymous trading platform. Uh, that That's in beta as well. And that's been a very good partnership as well. Um, and I'm partnering with some people in Taiwan at, at the moment to promote ProCryptos. And this person I'm partnering with is plugged into the IT and crypto of, uh, world of the Chinese and the Koreans. So I'm hoping we make some progress on that area. But anyway, back to content safe. Uh, the other side of the equation for content safe, which I think is worth talking about, is the distribution platforms like BitChute and Beacon. Uh, what I've noticed is, is that their problem is getting people to publish on their platforms. Right. So you've got some pretty popular people on YouTube like Sticks and Hammer, uh, who I listen to every day. Uh, that he publishes on B2 and BitChute. And my content safe users are doing the same. But to get other people to, to get on there, you have to, you have to be able to, to get the, the content distribution platform uh, content creators. So I see opportunity here for us to partner with these distribution platforms to help move content producers onto their platforms. Sure. The cooperation could come in the form of them funding us, or it could just come in the form of them creating APIs that we can easily link into. Because at present, BitChute doesn't have an API. We have to create our own means of uploading the BitChute automatically. And there are a lot of people who complain about uploading to B2 because it persists in failures yeah. uh, whenever you upload. We have overcome that, by the way. Our system, we went, took us an entire month to get this worked out, but our system just keeps, it knows how to look at every case where it fails and it keeps re-uploading until it finally succeeds. Uh, if we had an API with D2, may, or if we could just write directly to an IPFS folder, you know, something like that, that we could just help them get content creators. Uh, and we're going to do the same thing for Mines and Gav uh, as well. Very cool. Very cool. I, yeah, I, I'm really, so yeah, that's, really, really excited about Content Safe. It's it's much, much, uh, much needed. And by the way, um, we're getting a poor connection here. Uh, would you mind uh, turning off your video here and seeing if that's uh, if that might possibly help? Sure. Um, with that, um, and I can go ahead sure. and put something else on the screen. Sure. For, uh, I don't know what's up with my my device. I, you know, I, I should comment for people who would want to live in the Philippines. As long as you live in a major city, uh, you can get very good internet. But I would suggest you go with the fiber-based internet, so not the traditional uh, DSL. Because uh, the traditional DSL is generally pretty bad. Uh, but I've had pretty good luck with the fiber-based uh, DSL. Or excuse me, the fiber-based internet. 
this is a 100 Mbps line that we're talking on right now. Is it? And did it clear up? Uh, yes, it's not. Yes, it's it's not as. Uh, I mean, I could still hear you, but it was just a, a little staticky. But now it's yeah. it's it's definitely definitely better now. Um, so that's uh, so that's good. But yeah, like I was saying, you well, know, I, I'm I'm really really happy. Um, and especially like it's it's you and Daryl, like that's that's even better, because um, it's it's definitely uh, content safe is definitely something that's needed. Uh, now I'm sure uh, uh, you know my listeners are aware, and you, you're obviously aware. It's um, you, you saw the problem and you came up with a solution, but um, there is so much. Uh, there's some shenanigans happening on uh, on platforms like Fascist Book and Fascist Tube, and and uh, you know uh, even just uh, web host, you know web hosting platforms, um, and financial financial censorship too from like uh, PayPal and banks and 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 all of that. So um, it's it's really it's uh, you're really really mm -hmm. cool. Uh, you're tackling basically you're trying to tackle all of these obstacles um, with the uh, this with the deplatforming. Yes. Well, if you're publishing to five or ten different platforms. Um, especially ones that are decentralized and peer to peer, where no one can delete it, um, then your your content's safe forever. It's uh, um, it's much like torrenting in that way. Um, now, if uh, if you get shut down by PayPal or um, Patreon or or someone like that, um, that can be very damaging for a content creator if they're just wiped out of their you know income. If like their main source of income is Patreon and they get deplatformed, well, that's a problem. Um, that is uh, uh, definitely definitely a problem. And uh, so you're also you guys are also incorporating. Um, alternative, uh, I guess, uh, monetary or I guess alternative uh, ways for listeners to uh, contribute to the content creators they want to support. Um, I think that's a, a yeah. really, really, really great thing and uh, very, very necessary. And then uh, obviously just contributing to the overall um, decentralized uh, um, ecosystem. I think it's a really, really great thing. Now, one of the other things that I encountered over the years was I've worked a lot with payment gateways. In fact, one of my clients a few years ago, we had to, we had to switch payment gateways six times. And in the course of that, it helped me understand how these payment gateways generally work. And I've collected a, I know how to move to different platforms. <laughs> Essentially is the message. I understand how to move from the from one platform to the other. A lot of it's not really technological. A lot of it's just uh, filing documents to make sure that they you have a bank connected to it and that they accept you and all that. Now, that said, uh, this, is a di this is probably the most difficult part of the content creator's issue. And I really don't think that a traditional payment channel is going to ever be bulletproof. It's never going to be bulletproof. Mm -hmm. So what I'm thinking is, and I, a lot of people say this, that we need to switch over to crypto. And I agree. But what's going to have to happen is there going to have to be ways of cashing out or of buying things with crypto so that content creators can actually use their crypto directly without going back through the fiat networks. Uh, right. That's... That's what's got to happen. So I, I think as far as cashing back into fiat, I don't think that that's the solution. Uh, being able to buy my groceries in crypto is the next solution, not not cashing back out into fiat. Right. Yeah. And I I, I, I definitely I definitely agree, agree with that. And um, and I guess most people are aware, especially if they've been following my following my work for a while, that um, you know here here in uh, you know the USSA. Um, you know, there are platforms like uh, Gift and eGift, uh, eGifter, I think are the, the names of them. Um, I know Gift is definitely one of them, but they accept Bitcoin. So, and they have, uh, you know, hundred, maybe a hundred different places you can buy gift cards with, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoins from through, uh, you know, with Bitcoin. Um, and I, I, that's, that's a great thing. <clears throat> um, it really is, but it's still like an ex, it's still that kind of an extra step and it's kind of annoying, right? Um, and you can't get it, you can't get everything with it. Um, you can't get everything through there. Um, now you can buy, uh, you know, stuff on Amazon through purse. Um, you, you can buy most anything you need to with Bitcoin. Obviously you can't pay your, you probably can't pay your rent in it. You probably can't, um, I don't know, pay your mortgage. You can't pay your thefts, uh, your taxes. Um, thankfully that'd be weird. Um, I don't know if I'd like that. Um, uh, so, so obviously, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, you're the state of Ohio now accepts the tax payments in Bitcoin. I, th I think I saw something about that. Yeah. I think I saw something about mm -hmm. that. But, not, uh, not that I would want to do that either. <laughs> no, forget that. Yeah, that not that I wouldn't want to do that. It seems, seems kind of like a trap, right? Because if you pay if you pay your taxes in Bitcoin, uh, you don't report your taxes on your uh, on your uh, you know uh, on your you know income. Yeah. it seems like it could be a problem. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, so I mean, yeah. there are ways to get to a lot of the stuff you need um, with with Bitcoin, but it takes that extra step. You can't just uh, spend it. Now there is there is uh, one thing people have been promoting for a while, and it's uh, um, oh gosh, what's the uh, there's you can get like a Bitcoin debit cards. And uh, people are like, "Oh, this yeah. is this, this is incredible! Like you can pay with you can pay with Bitcoin. It just takes it right out of your account, and then like they take a picture of it, and it just says Visa, like on the bottom right. And it's like he realizes <laughs> this is not a permanent solution. And plus, this is not uh, like the the idea is not to merge you know to merge you know the second realm technology with technology the first realm with Visa. You know who is you know what's one of the the targets of Bitcoin as far as you know what it's trying to eliminate? Well, central banks, um, and uh, you know the, uh, the the big banking system." How like it, it just it, I don't know I, I see a lot of people promoting it and it's kind of annoying I, I I guess I understand it um a lot of people a lot of people believe that um and and I guess I, I kind of shared the sentiment as well but uh you know like it has to be, be you have to be able to spend it um you know it can be used as a um, you know a store of value and that's great you know Bitcoin's great for that um but you know um, at this time um you know maybe it's maybe it's just not the right time for it I don't know but um you know you kind of got to be able to spend it. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think it's coming. It, it, it is coming. And it's just a matter of time. Uh, I would have to agree with J.W. Weatherman in the sense that we don't really need a better UI. I think what we have right now is, the, is best. It's as good as it's ever going to get as far as UI. So there's really, that's, that's an excuse. Uh, if you were going to use Coinomi for a transaction, that's simple, isn't it? Right, right. Yeah, and even um, uh, like, uh, and this is, you know, this is, I guess, one reason I like Bitcoin so much over, uh, even Monero, I, I was in love with Monero last year. And even when I was in love with it, I had so many problems with their GUI wallets. Um, I couldn't even, <clears throat> um, it was after one of their hard forks, I had problems with it for like three months. And I got, I, you know, I, I, tr I worked on it for a couple hours, got pissed off and kind of left it alone for a few weeks, went back and tried it again, got pissed off and stopped, you know, just like gave up. And uh, like with the Bitcoin Electrum mm -hmm. wallets, now granted, I'm not running my, I'm running my own full node, uh, but... I it's I've never had a single problem with it. It always works. It's super easy. And like if you're buying a gift card on Gift, you don't have to en have to enter the amount or anything. You just uh, you just click you know open you know open wallet and then it just auto fills the information. You hit send, type in your password, and it's done. Um, like it's just so smooth, so easy. I mean, it's I I'd say it's uh, you know uh, obviously it might be uh, like uh, the one click thing on Amazon. It's pretty easy too. Um, that's my it might be a little easier. But it's I mean as far as any checkout flows on the internet. Um, it's, it's really, really that easy. So, um, <clears throat> now obviously, you know, I, I guess there, there are some complicated parts to it for people who aren't familiar with it, but once you do a couple of few transactions, um, through something like Electrum, um, I mean, you've, you've got it down. Um, it's, it's not really complicated. I, I agree. I agree. It's just, it's just a matter of not really simplifying the interface, but just getting people used to doing it. Once they're used to doing it, it's easy. Right. I think it's just as simple as that. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, that 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 is the future, and it's not that far off. And I think that we're going to see in 2020, we're going to see even more significant things happening in the Bitcoin sphere. Right now, you got some of the guys that are in the EOS world uh, that they really think that they're the next big thing, and I, I think they will be for the next three to five years. But I also think that uh, EOS is poison uh, yeah. because ultimately, you know, it's, it's got those 15 block producers and it, it's just not going to be a viable technology to, to protect transactions. And I've even heard of them already killing people's accounts. So yeah, that's uh, that's that, that's that's, that's, not a, yeah, that's that's a major problem. And I guess what one other thing with that I'll mention with Bitcoin and and, and this was a uh, uh, this this was kind of a problem for folks uh, during I guess the uh, um, the the big bull run. But uh, you know high fees and slow transaction times. Well, Lightning. You know a lot of the Bitcoin Cash folks are like, well, you know you said Lightning was coming for like four years now. It's not. You know it's your you know your your uh, people uh, merchants are stopping you know stopping uh, you know are stopping accepting Bitcoin because. Uh, you know the transaction fees and all that. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit of a problem. Sure, um, I, I I understand that. Um, but Lightning is is it's here, man. Um, I don't know, like if you follow uh, crypto Twitter um, at all. 
Um, there's so much testing going on. There's so many things coming out. Light Lightning Labs is doing a bunch of terrific work, and I mean, I think they're they're trying they're doing some testing with like Litecoin and such too. But um, you know, like with the Lightning Network with Bitcoin, uh, I think I saw. Like within the past week, uh, there's like $4 million um, on the Lightning Network. Like that's not a lot, right? That's not ne even near no, the market cap of Bitcoin, but that's, but that's huge. Um, that's that's progress, yeah, and people yeah. can people can make transactions, you know, uh, you know, via the Lightning Network. And for for the listeners who may not be familiar with the Lightning Network, I'm not going to try to explain it like really technically, and maybe Matthew can um, can can step in. But um, basically, uh, it's uh, it's an off chain scaling solution where um, you have payment channels. Uh, you're not you're not settling on chain with every transaction, um, but uh, it's it's you know very low fees. You just open up payment channels. Um, uh, and you have uh, low fees, quick transaction times, and then at some point, um, a bundle of transactions is settled on chain. Um, so it's very, very good right. for privacy too, because um, it's not uh, you know every transaction right. isn't going on the blockchain or you know on the uh, on the ledger. Um, you know, there's a big bundle of transactions, so yours can blend in a lot better. Uh, so I, I think there's there's just so much so many positive things, and with uh, with Lightning, um, with with with, uh, and I guess we'll we'll talk about this uh, you know uh, later on. But uh, like with Darklands, Lightning could be a very very um, you know good integration um, if there's ever high fees again, and Bitcoin is the you know the method of payment uh, at least well, at, at launch uh, for Darklands. There's also like the mem Mimble Wimble right protocol, which some people are working on integrating to Bitcoin. But I've read something the other day that Litecoin is going to be integrating it before Bitcoin. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's possible. we've got more secure privacy stuff. We've got more privacy stuff coming very soon. And you're, I, you're right. I, I don't even say Lightning is coming. I say Lightning is here. And uh, I know that uh, I'm going to be advocating uh, new clients using Lightning to accept payments. Right. Yeah, that's 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 great to hear. And then also, I guess another thing I'll mention about privacy with Bitcoin is, you know, that has been a focus for for um, for a lot of people uh, within the Bitcoin space. Um, like there are two uh, two really good wallets, uh, Samurai and Wasabi wallets, and uh, those are both uh, super super heavily privacy focused. Um, so those you know those exist now. Obviously, you know, um, <laughs> um, I heard uh, oh, oh, what is her name? Um, she's uh, I guess the the head of Lightning Labs. I can't. Uh, um, I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember what her name is, um, but uh, she was she was saying like, uh, well, people are you know people are saying that uh, Lightning Network isn't real because it's still in beta, and she's she said, you know, Bitcoin's kind of still in beta, right? Um, so <laughs> like it's 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 still yeah. it's still a very yeah. very new thing, um, and you know with those two wallets, right. you know they're they're working. Things are obviously always developed upon, and uh, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm very very positive about uh, about uh, you know the um, you know the Bitcoin scaling uh, privacy. All of it, and it can it, it'll be a, a great tool for a lot of open source projects, and uh, um, for for content safe too. I mean, I I, I don't know um, the, the the financial aspect is really difficult for you know content creators, but uh, something like uh, Lightning, um, I, I don't know. Do, do you have any idea if because I think one of the problems with like something like Bitbacker is that uh, um, like with Patreon, it automatically pulls it from your your, your you know your debit card, your bank account. Um, and mm -hmm. people don't have to, people don't even have to think about it. Um, well, with Bitbacker, if you have to manually send you know your money each month, a lot of, some people are going to forget. Like it's not you know it's not really uh, really reliable in that sense. People forget. People have a lot going on uh, and all that. Do you have any idea? I, I can't remember if I heard something about this or not. Do you know if Lightning the Lightning Network has uh, could have could enable any features such as like auto pull from a, from a wallet? No, that I would say definitely not. No. Uh, that that would be my my gut answer is no, because the, they that do would be have a problem. To, that would be a problem in some sense, right? Right. Yeah, it would be. Uh, my feeling is that you know, really, the reason that auto payments occur in the center, it, and I know this because I've worked in business and I've I've had clients tell me this that that's what they wanted. They wanted the ability to automatically deduct, so that the customer didn't really have a chance to say no. Mm -hmm. So what we need to remember is if we want auto payments, what we, my opinion, okay, people will probably not like this, but my opinion is it should be built into the wallet that it remembers when to pay. I mean, come on, the wallet's got a clock on it, doesn't it? Sure, sure. And it can, and it can flash you a notification and say, oh, you owe so much to this person. Do you want to send it? Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
I, I mean, I mean, that's it's just that simple. You don't need uh, a third party system or a or a trustless payment system necessarily. In fact, you want payment systems to be trustless or no, I, I just don't think so. I, I think that let everybody's carrying a phone. Everybody's connected to the Internet. If they want an automatic payment system, offer it in the wallet. That's a very good point. The wallet. Right? Uh, and, and you know what? If the person likes what you're doing, they're just going to say, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's a, a very very uh, a very good point. So um, I guess back to back to content safe here. I mean, we, we've we've covered uh, um, I guess uh, uh, most of I guess I'd say most of what you guys are doing over there, which is uh, which is fantastic. Um, I guess uh, since I'd say that uh, most of my listeners, um, if they are content creators, they're they're kind of like me, where they don't have uh, they aren't making a whole lot of money um, to where they can uh, you know afford a uh, you know a hundred dollar a month plan. Um, but I do think this is I do think a, a service like Content Safe is uh, um, is a, a great well, thing, and that's uh, uh, and that's some of my content creators that are listeners uh, might be interested in something mm -hmm. like the uh, like the starter tier. So could you kind of uh, uh, tell them yeah. a bit about that and, and what's uh, what they would get in that uh, in that tier and you know, some for more information on that? Well, basically, our pricing structure is kind of still in flux, so it's not like we've locked in our prices and that that's what it's going to be forever, but what I'm looking at is smaller content creators generally don't need to republish all that much. They publish like once a week, right? Right. Like you publish once a week. So what I've been trying to, to price out is something that we could rebroadcast to a select number of platforms and measure it in terms of how big your video is or your audio. Uh, I don't know your experience, but, Audio broadcasts can run anywhere from a half, or say like 300 MB to one and a half uh, gigabytes for a show. Sure. If you're yeah. doing one a week, right? Well, the first plan is 50 gig of bandwidth, and we would be rebroadcasting that to, let's suppose we rebroadcast it to three platforms, because you can choose how many platforms you want to rebroadcast to. Uh, you could fit all that into the plan, the twenty-seven dollar a month plan. Right. Yeah, five hundred gigabytes. That's that's a lot of story, especially if you're doing only audio podcasts. Um, I mean, you, you I mean, yeah. you'd you'd be sick of podcasting by the time you by the time you reach that cap, I think. <laughs> right, and it was actually fifty gig, but you know, fifty gig. Uh, that's well, oh yeah, yeah fifty gig. Yeah, yeah that's but that's still, still a ton. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of guys are producing low low quality content, so it's not like everybody's a Ruben report, uh, which is like the, the do everything the gig real well, and they're like three and four hour shows. Right. So and he publishes I don't know three or four times a week. <laughs> right. It's yeah. it's some ridiculous, thing, but he also makes a ton of money. And we're trying to look to those big content producers as partners. So if anybody is listening to the Vanu podcast here that is a big content producer, we are willing to partner with people that do that and work with your IT team. We don't want to replace your IT team. We want to enable your IT team to do higher value things and uploading videos. Uh, I know I, I, one of the people I want to reach out to is the guys at 21st Century Wire. Uh, have you heard of them? No, I can't say I have. Uh, you should you should look into them. They're really cool. Um, they they do uh, international reporting. They have journalists all over the world, and they really represent uh, an alt media perspective. So they were anti Syria war, uh, just lots of really cool stuff that they've been talking about for several years now. And I hmm. listen to their. They have another podcast called uh, the Boiler Room. And the guy who is there in men hosts the boiler room. And he's like, you know, man, I would upload the gab and the bit shoot and all that, but I don't got time. By the time I prepare for the show and do all my other work and editing, he said, I just don't got time to upload the two or three other platforms. So that's what content's safe for. We can partner with these groups to help them have more time to do what they really would prefer to be doing. So yeah, someone like a sticks and hammer, right? 
yeah. but dude, he uploads six videos a day and he's doing DTube bit shoot. Well, he would rather be out in his garden than he would upload a video. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and videos, uh, obviously, depending upon the, the, the connection speed, can take quite a while to upload a video. So that's a, a lot of, uh, you know, right. uh, idle time uh, just doing that. And I want to clarify this for, for, for the listeners here. Um, and this is something we were, talk, we were talking about uh, privately, which I thought was a really, really cool feature. Um, and, yeah, I want to just reemphasize this, that um, basically... Um, it's one user interface. You click publish, and it automatically broadcasts it out to um, however many platforms you select. Right, so you you only have to upload once, right? And then it it be sent out. You know what? You don't even have to upload. If you want to use our system as your upload upload point, you can. But if you want to just continue publishing to YouTube, we'll we'll suck it right off of YouTube for you and rebroadcast it. Oh wow! Okay, that's that's handy. And it's all scheduled, so you can go in and say, "I want this republished immediately," or "I want it republished, you know, in a day," or it's all—it's got a calendar that you can schedule the re rebroadcast. Awesome, awesome, very cool, very cool. So, um, I guess yeah. uh, um, there was there's one other thing I noticed on your site, and I've been there a handful of times, just reading reading through stuff, probably more than a handful of times. Um, yeah, very very well done on the site, and uh, um, I and very good very good uh, uh, copy too. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very very uh, very good site. Um, but uh, yeah, I noticed uh, on under the fortress here, uh, one of the features is shadow ban testing. Um, now, hopefully, you know this isn't you know like a proprietary proprietary thing. Well, obviously, I mean proprietary. I don't think, but uh, but no. uh, but basically, like uh, it's not some secret thing that you know the, if if you t if you tell if you tell how it how it's done that it secrets out. But um, so yeah, obviously, you don't feel like you have to answer. But how how do you test for for shadow banning it's pretty simple you just we pick a set of keywords or names from your videos and we look to see what youtube pans back ah okay that so if they're shadow banning you that means that you're not showing up on the search results okay gotcha even though you put in the exact title of the video you, you don't show up <laughs> gotcha okay okay yeah yeah that's okay that's that's pretty easy yeah if, I've, I've heard of that sort of thing before i think james corbett's mentioned that uh if you type in like the exact well, search terms of this video, you have to go back to like page three before you can actually find it. Right. Yeah. And see what's innovative about this is that it's automatic. You don't got to go and do it yourself. And we're not at the point where we have the reports stuff written yet. But once we have the report stuff written, it will like give you an update on what page that your results show up on. It'll give you all these sorts of metrics so that you can have an idea of what's happened. Gotcha. Okay, very good, very good. And and for 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 uh, and I've never I don't think I've experienced it myself. Um, I I don't think so. I've I don't know. I've slipped pretty I've slipped pretty under the radar. I still have a monetized YouTube account, so um, that's uh, <laughs> strange. For now, uh, there's yeah for for now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, just I'm just waiting waiting for the day. Um, and some of the, some of the video like their algorithms are so inconsistent too because so like some of my more mild videos won't get like they won't be approved for all advert advertisers. And then one where we talk about like uh, the faux state solution, which involves like you know violent subjects, that one's perfectly fine to be monetized. So, and I don't know, um, I don't know. Anyway, I'm just gonna ride it out as long as I can, and <laughs> and uh, you know when it happens, I, I, hey, I, I certainly won't be surprised. To be honest, to be honest, I think what's happening is that the the despite all this talk of AI, which is absolute bullshit. It really is absolute bullshit. They don't really have a sophisticated AI doing this. They have a simple keyword filter, not an AI. And believe me, because I've worked with Bayesian AIs, and I know how hard it is to get accurate classification on a Bayesian AI. It's really, really hard. Especially whenever, let's say, like a spam filter, it works pretty simplistically. You know, it's it is spam, it isn't. But even then, how often do you find stuff that isn't spam in your spam box? Oh gosh, I have I have to actually a go lot. back like every few days and check. Um, yeah, like even emails mm -hmm. I sent responses get sent there, and it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, like the right. spam filters, like even for uh, like my my main like I guess my kind of throwaway personal account. Um, is a Yahoo one, um, and even Yahoo sucks. Um, it's terrible. 
Um, yeah. It's really, really yeah. bad. Yeah, exactly. And, and see, my whole point is that if you move this out into uh, a wider range of categories, right, and they'd have to, they couldn't just say, oh, present it, don't present it. That's not going to work. You need to say, like, what kind of video is this? So you have to classify what it is, right? So it's political. It's uh, entertaining. It's this, that, the other, right? They have to have a way to classify it that way so that they can make better decisions. That's why I say they're not using any sophisticated AI on it. They're just putting a list of keywords in their block and you base the keyword. And since you don't approach the, your podcast with typical terminology, you fall under the radar. Did I get knocked uh, off there? No, no, oh, you're right. you're you're still here as long as as long as you can hear me. Um, so nope. um, I I guess what you're saying. Yeah, then, I, 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 heard, I. Uh, what was that? Go ahead. Okay. Um, can you hear? Can you well, hear me, Matthew? What happened? Uh oh. So we got some technical here? difficulties. Yeah, I can hear. You. Okay. Cool. Cool. I'm trying to get this thing back in the. <laughs> no lights. Yeah, go go okay. ahead. Yeah, so so I, I guess what you're saying then is that uh, uh, you know the robots robots aren't going to take over the world anytime soon. No, in fact, you know my opinion about AI in general is what we need to watch out for is these inherent limitations that AIs have. That's where most of the danger is at. That, that ultimately uh, something like, say, Amazon, uh, Amazon's Alexa, it needs a human to come in and correct it whenever it's, it, it makes a mistake because it will never be smart enough. The, the AI models have not really progressed that much. So this thing like uh, saying that it, by 2040, AIs will be replacing humans, I, I'm very skeptical about that. I just don't think the technology is that far along. And uh, that's coming from someone who's experimented with it. And I've even listened to people in the computer science industry talking about it. And they're like, they're skeptical of the kind of Kurzweil. Uh, yeah. And these are people who work in AI research. And I just don't think that Kurzweil knows something they don't know. Right, and and I did see. I, and I, I don't. Was, I don't know if this is real. Like I just yeah. I saw it on Twitter, and it lo it looked you know like it looked like a it looked like a, a real real video, um or real GIF rather. But it seemed yeah. like some car company was testing out their vehicle collision like deterrent system, like the you know the AI sort of one uh, run one. And there was like uh, I guess mm -hmm. three three executives out there that just lay like, over standing out there you know waiting for the car to turn out of the way. It just didn't. <laughs> they got plowed over. See, I don't think it's real for that reason. I, I don't know if they maybe. I don't know if they'd be dumb yeah. enough to do that. Well, I, I, I do know that there are confirmed cases where people have been hit by driverless cars. I oh, yeah, don't know sure. about that one in particular. And I'm not saying before anybody overreacts. I am not saying that it's impossible to create some sophisticated AI that that maybe match or make you think it was human. But there's a few limitations on computing power that people don't normally factor in. What makes the human mind so powerful is the interconnections of neurons. If you were to try to replicate that same sort of level of density of interconnections in a silicon-based platform, you're going to have to have probably something the size of a room to do that even with current micro technology. So how are you gonna make this AI, right? That is mm -hmm. so darn smart. You're not gonna be able to yet. I used, I had a client in London who was a specialist in AI. This was like 10 years ago. And she wrote articles about this 10 years ago. And she said, Kurzweil's wrong. She said that the level of of density, she said, we're probably not going to have this type of technology for 400 years. It's wow. just, we think we're so advanced when actually we're not really that advanced yet. 
And, and you know, part of this is because there were companies, startups, say five to six years ago, who were getting investor money to cl- claiming that they could copy the human brain. And this one particular company raised, it raised over a billion dollars and it ended up shutting down because it failed to do what it claimed it could do. Mm -hmm. Right. So the real danger here is overestimating what an AI can do. That's where the real danger is. And and I think that's what we're experiencing right now. Uh, Build a better AI to make YouTube safe for for, for viewers. No, that's very dangerous extremely dangerous uh, because it isn't that smart and that brings me to freelancing you know i freelance and to be honest i make less money off the freelancing platforms than i do off my own human network uh, which i built up over 25 years my experience with the freelance sites are that they try to adopt overly simplistic methodologies for assessing the skill level and behavior of their freelancer. So I had an incident, I won't name the platform, but I had an incident recently where uh, someone said that I was uh, violating their terms of service because I was publishing something that was uh, a violate of another service's terms of service. And what I had done was I had just finished doing a seminar in Europe on uh, a product called HA Proxy, which is high availability proxy. It's a 20 year old open source project that's used by all sorts of uh, IT companies to manage and load balance their servers. And so after I finished the seminar, I added a gig to my portfolio saying, I can show you how to work with HA Proxy. And I immediately got you know, taken down and saying, you violated our our terms of service. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to get two layers of humans before the obvious could be said, like, how in the world could I have violated a copyright on something that was open source? Yeah, no joke. Right? So here's like an example of how AIs are dangerous because I, I told them, it looks like you have a simple keyword filter and if it's it's a white it's a blacklist or excuse me a whitelist. If I if I don't have that term in my dictionary, then you are violating the terms of service. Well, what kind of genius does something like that? That's crazy. Mm-hmm. There are so many technologies out there, and you're going to immediately threaten to shut someone's account down because you didn't have the word in your list. Right. That's that's insane, and that's why dark lance is needed. Because there isn't any of that in dark lands. <laughs> right. No, there's, there's, there, there's certainly not. Yeah, that was a, a very, a, a very good transition. Uh, and, and I guess another thing too, and as, a, as, as speaking from a freelancer perspective here, um, uh, you know, for the the major freelancing platforms, um, I guess an, another kind of uh, downside from it is that, um, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I don't really, I don't care about this. I mean, it's just what's, uh, it's just what's, what's there. But uh, um, like, uh, if if you go on there with a new account and you have no, you have like uh, uh, no reputation yet, uh, just no reputation, um, and you're competing mm-hmm. with people in India who will, you know, do a job for five dollars an hour, uh, it's not worth yep. it. Like, and when I started, I was like, okay, I'll probably have to do, you know, a handful of these jobs, um, and not make any money off them just so I can get, you know, some ratings. But you know, I started yep. scrolling through all the bids, and people are going down to like three, four dollars an hour, and it's like I this is just not worth my time. Um, it's just not worth it. I filled out so hey. many, so many, get, you know, I filled out so many bids for so many jobs yeah. and, uh, you know, it just never, uh, you know, and maybe I wasn't doing it, you know, the perfect way. Maybe I was, maybe I was doing some things wrong, but, uh, at the same time, it's just, how, how do you compete with that? If you live in, if you live in somewhere like this, my opinion, there's two things I would say, uh, is one, if you can get into the ground floor of a freelance site, early before it has a lot of people in it then that's one way to get in uh i'm applying for another service i'll tell you off air because i don't want to promote any of these products uh look and it's got a unique stick they claim that they interview all their freelancers before they list them 
So I'm trying it out. Hopefully what that will mean is I get in on the ground floor of something that's really new. So there aren't a lot of competitors in it and they vet people. So you don't have a lot of crap in there at the beginning because you got to pass, you got to talk to them and right. prove that you're competent in whatever it is. This is another gripe I have. I don't like these skill tests because what they're trying to do with skill tests is they're trying to eliminate the need to invest time to talk to you. Uh, if I understand this service correctly, there are no skill tests. They interview you. They look at your your your, your CV, mm -hmm. and they make an assessment whether they want to work with you or not. Right. Uh, seems better. That's one way. The other way that you could do this if you don't get in early is just get some friends and family to start – giving you small gigs because what what matters at the beginning is getting some things on your portfolio right right and i'm not saying i'm not saying cheat i'm not saying don't actually do the work i'm saying do something for people you know and have them pay for you on that service that's one way that it will help uh because if you get like say 10 or 15 or 20 gigs on there and everybody's giving you high scores that's going to raise your value out in the pool and make you competitive. Sure. Sure. So yeah. I know with mine, I was kind of lucky. like on one platform that I get the most amount of freelance stuff. I, I just got lucky. I was in at the very beginning. There wasn't that much competition. And in that particular platform, because each one has its own little variation of what makes it unique. They had a deal where you could just go out and start soliciting directly to buyers. And that helps immensely because if you've got this firewall between you and the buyer, the buyer can't really see what your worth is. He just looks at your rating and that's it. You don't get a chance to really tell him something about yourself. Uh, and, and I believe that helps because I got some decent gigs that way. Uh, and the rest of it's just, you know, time and accumulation of experience. But I have the same complaint you do. If I came with 20 years of experience in a portfolio, I am no different now than the guy who just graduated in Mumbai from college. Now, right. something about that just doesn't seem right to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly agree with you. I uh, certainly agree with you. So um, I... So yeah, I guess let's let's start talking about Darkwing and how we're how we're going to uh, you know re resolve some of these uh, some of these problems. So as you mentioned, um, the white paper uh, I guess the it's not the first draft, but it's the first edition uh, of the white paper has been has been released, and um, that was uh, that was a fun journey. That was the first white paper I've ever written. Um, so um, that was uh, uh, well, well, thank you, I appreciate that. So uh, uh, definitely check that out, tinyurl.com forward slash Darklands white paper. Um, for the listeners out there who want to check it out, uh, and I will, uh, um, I've got some work to do on the website, but I actually got uh, two local uh, gigs here, which I, I, I guess uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, like you're saying, you know, friends and family um, uh, building them WordPress sites. Um, I mean, it's it's, it's yeah. really easy to do, um, but if someone has no idea how to do any of this stuff, like they've never set up a website before, um, I can provide a service there, right? Um, and uh, that's that's definitely needed for people who are new to to this uh, new to this thing. So um, that's uh, uh, so yeah, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to get back to the Darklands so uh, w uh, website yet, but it's up there. You can check it out. Um, there's there's definitely some work to be done. I need to add the link to the white paper there, um, but I just haven't uh, haven't gotten around to it yet. So, um, so you mentioned early on that uh, uh, some of your some of your reasons for for coming up with Darklands, um, <clears throat> basically just the problems with the with the, uh, with the freelancing platforms. Um, but uh, I guess uh, so. I, I guess let's go ahead and get to. Uh, so yeah, I did a podcast on this actually, uh, like a, a few days after at least the white paper, and uh, tried to get as technical as I could. But now that we've got you here, we should probably uh, be good to uh, get into some more of the technical details uh, for the listeners who uh, who may want to hear sure. that sort of stuff. So, um, so Scuttlebutt, uh, can you give us a technical overview of how uh, how the uh, Scuttlebutt Scuttlebutt, uh, Scuttlebutt network functions? Well, see, people need to understand that one of the greatest events in in IT personal freedom was BitTorrent. Uh, the concept of BitTorrent underlies Scuttlebot. 
uh, the idea is that you have these peer-to-peer exchanges of personal key, uh, of private of public keys that identify you, and it's distributed in what's called a, D, a distributed hash table. And that way, all these peers can connect to one another and verify one another's identity using cryptography. Mm-hmm. And in those encrypted messages, they have a standardized format for messaging. And we can actually customize that. So the idea is to create these communities of freelancers and buyers, right? I, I don't know if you read my comments in the white paper that I put yesterday. Did you happen oh, to catch them? No, I haven't. I, I haven't pulled. I haven't pulled that up yet. Um, I'll go. Uh, I'll go check it out. <laughs> I, I was. Yeah, I wasn't sure, but I, I can kind of give you a taste of what I said. Uh, I think we could almost look at these like guilds. So you've got these regional guilds, or or at least online guilds of graphic designers, programmers, etc. And these can build not only. Like, let's say that I build a guild of developers on Darklands, and I use, I use Scuttlebot to communicate with them, and I know them because they've worked with me, right? Or mm-hmm. I know them because they went to school with me or whatever. I could actually take the whole reputation of the guild itself and say, the guild says that this person's good. Right. Right? So it's it's a higher level of confidence in the outsourcer that on the other dimension, the buyers come in and they send messages or they join guilds as clients. And what we do is we publish portfolios or skill lists. And then these things become searchable to our client, to to the, to the buyers. So if they want to look for something, they've enrolled in these different guilds and they go search. Okay. I need somebody who knows, uh, uh, how to make Adobe Acrobat documents, mm-hmm. for instance, and, and it pulls up a list of uh, you know I, keys and says these people uh, in your ascribed guilds published that they know these things, and then you look at their ratings, and then maybe you say, oh, you know, I know this guy over here. Uh, let me talk to him since he's on the rec- he's on the reference list. For this guy. That's how I see Darkland work. Over Scuttlebutt. Right. So there's a communications and matching up technology. And actually, you know, yeah, we're probably going to have more problems than I think. Because it's always more complicated than you imagine talking about it. But it looks to me like this nothing here is like needing an AI or some sort of sophisticated technology. The stuff's already there. We just have to connect everything together right yeah it's just so it's just a search the, the function. Scuff- right and you know what you don't even need google man you it only makes sense for you to uh maybe we could have like a a a, a place that people that guilds go to to list skills right mm-hmm. and w- what we do there is we publish a list of skills with a list of uh, uh, pubs, right? Because each guild has its own pub. And, and in that place, uh, they could make and connect, oh, this is a buyer. Uh, I'm interested in this guild, right? Or you don't even, a guild could be one person perhaps, but, you know, uh, anyway, that's a technicality. Uh, <laughs> am I making sense? Or am I saying too much? No, you're no. It it, it definitely makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. But I I, I guess I kind of buried the lead there for for those who didn't uh, actually listen to that first episode. Who haven't checked out the white paper. You kind of get the gist of it. But uh, Darklands is a privacy focused freelancing marketplace uh, utilizing Bitcoin for payment. So the idea is to replace, or and we're, not, we're probably not going to replace them, but to to provide an alternative to these centralized freelancing platforms, um, and uh, focus on privacy. Do you think it's a lot better? Not use ridiculous. Uh, um, AI that uh, threatens to ban someone, you know, threatens to kick someone, you know, suspend someone's account over something like you went through, Matthew. Um, so we're, we're just trying to provide an alternative yeah. to this for people who are privacy focused, for self liberators, for digital nomads um, who've had problems on those sites and who want to move on to something that's uh, 
uh, something more like uh, what, we're, what we're trying to build uh, for, for Darklands. So, um, yeah, I like that. Um, I, I, I definitely like that. And uh, I, I certainly think that, um, you know, uh, just as just as, you know, this past 13 months of working together, I, I think the, these ideas are going to uh, evolve. And uh, I, I think that's uh, certainly a great thing. So. Um, so yeah, that's that's scuttlebutt, and um, I guess I'll ask that I, I I kind of covered this in the in the in the first episode, but I want to hear kind of a, a more of a uh, I guess a perspective from a, de a developer, and I'm sure the listeners would appreciate that too. Um, what are I guess uh, how, how are uh, what are the uh, privacy features of of uh, of uh, scuttlebutt um, as they are now, or I guess uh, privacy well, and security really, features? Well, uh, public key cryptography is the main you know the main thing for scuttlebutt uh everything's encrypted we can put it since we're putting it over i2p that means that your anonymity is higher than if you were just putting it over the clear web which you would have no anonymity at all at, on the on the clear web right and, uh, and, and for, and for offers the... a high degree Yep, I'll just say uh, I2P, the Internet Visibility Project, uh, just a way to it's just an anonymous network layer over the internet. Um, sorry, I just want to step in. I mean, I, I I forget that a lot, so that a lot of people aren't ten, like haven't looked into this stuff a lot. So I just want to make sure that we we try we define these things as we go. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And, and you know, by us uh, carefully packaging everything up, whenever we we publish this, there's no need for them to even know what I2P is. They just download the app. And it automatically connects to I2P. Sure. <laughs> that that's the goal, right? Let's let's make sure that they don't need to know any of this. <laughs> but uh, security culture says they should know what's going on, and so that they can put confidence in. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, as I as I put in the white paper, uh, and as we kind of talked about with. Uh, um, oh gosh, the uh, the guiding principles of the project. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll I I guess uh, we'll put together, um, you know, security culture guides, and we will um, tell you what these technologies are. But you don't have to know it to use it. Um, even if you just you know uh, don't even if you never look at the guides, even I don't know how we're going to actually implement this, but you don't even have to look at the guides. But we're going to put them there um, and encourage you to 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 take a look and just you know read the summary, how it works. And uh, all that good stuff, because, uh, you know, this is fascinating technology. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of some of the freelancers you might get probably don't care about security or privacy. And that's fine. They just want, uh, you know, alternative where they can make some money. And uh, that's uh, that's that's uh, all well and good. But for the crypto anarchists out there, for the anarchists, for 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 privacy minded folks, um, I think it's crucially important uh, for them to know what they're using so that they can use it elsewhere, because this is only one aspect, um, you know, of, uh, of, of our lives is making money. So um, if they can utilize this for, you know, for private communications, you know, like utilize I2P for, for whatever, if they can utilize um, public key, key encryption for email, like using a PGP or GPG, uh, I think that's, that's crucially important. So um, that's uh, another big part of the project. I mean, this is, this is uh, just as with everything I, everything I really do, it's with Vanu in mind. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's important to promote that as, as much as possible, not for my sake, but for, for, for the sake of people's freedom and privacy. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, that's what this is all about. Th this, is, this is about providing the individual with the ability to be responsible. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, that's thoughts. one way I look at it. Yeah. Right? It, it, let's, let's enable people to be responsible rather than taking away responsibilities from them. And if you wanted to know what the real beauty of AI could be, it could allow humans to do more with their innate abilities. That's what AI should focus on, not replacing what they can do, but it, enabling them to cover up deficiencies that are just inherent in our wetware, right? Mm -hmm. Our wetware has some inherent deficiencies. Uh, but at the same time, that's why I think our wetware is so powerful than hardware, because it that those deficiencies might appear to be insurmountable, but actually they could be covered over. And I use that word deliberately. They could be covered over by creating AIs that work with you personally. Look at I've been thinking about this for years. What if? You could create things that monitor what you do, but they don't 
broadcast those to a central government or a corporation? What if you could profile your life and analyze how you work so that you could become more efficient in how you work without sharing that with people, right? You could have it as your own. You could study it. You could the, the AI and the, the computer could show you where your deficiencies are at. Well, why would I need, want to share that with anybody? Why can't I just use it for myself? Uh, yeah. I've thought about apps that would monitor your app use, but I don't want to broadcast that back and sell the data. I would like to have an intelligent report that I could then assess for myself. Well, am I spending too much time watching cat video? <laughs> right uh just to be flipped yeah yeah I, I mean yeah there's there's uh i don't know i mean uh, as i think yeah with with any technology uh you know it's it's uh, and this is such a cliche saying now but you know it is it is a double-edged sword i mean this, these things can be used for really incredible things or they can be used for for uh, really really terrible things um so yeah yeah uh certainly certainly right there with you um, now I want to speak to another thing that, that was kind of your, your idea, um, or at least I, I guess, uh, well, yeah, it was, it was something you brought in, you, you brought up as a, as an aspect of dark Lance as a, a secondary, uh, um, a secondary reputation model. Um, and it's the circle and web of trust, a circle or web of trust, however you want to, however, however you want to phrase it. And so uh, we talked about this a little bit with the, the what, what you, or you talked about it a little bit with the guilds thing or with, uh, you know, the various guilds, the various pubs, but, um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Le leading question here, but uh, and, and I know the answer to it. But for the benefit of the listeners, uh, why do you why do you view um, the circle of web of trust uh, as a superior uh, superior reputation system versus just um, ratings and, and ratings and reviews? Well, ultimately, isn't it that the only people you can really know are the ones you've met? I mean, mm -hmm. if you have friends on Facebook, what do you know about them? They could be a bot, uh, right? They, they could be someone entirely not, not who you think they are. And that's the beauty of Circle of Trust. It begins by if you follow proper protocol, because it ultimately comes down to the self-discipline to not add someone in your first rank of trust that you haven't met personally or that you haven't at least talked to, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't met you personally, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? I've talked to you, but I've interacted with you at length, and I'm pretty sure you're not a bot. <laughs> uh, I hope not. I hope right? Not. And if you work for a corporation, man, uh, heaven save them. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess you could be uh, an NSA agent that's just playing the game with me, but uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, but ultimately, you should have a close tie the people in your first rank and that's why web of trust i think is probably about as good as it's ever going to get you're not going to be able to get better than that and if you go out to the second ring in the web of trust now these are people that are known by people you know and that is a slightly that, that's a recommendation system right uh standard uh i get recommended by a friend to someone he knows but i don't know them well, this this, is, this is how this, this is how we how we came in contact, right? It was through um, we both had, I guess, yes. uh, we both had Daryl, uh, you know, on our first, you know, first, you know, first ring, and uh, he put us in contact. So that's that's how this, yeah, this entire thing started was utilizing that uh, that recommendation from someone in our first circle. Yes, exactly. Um, so that 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 to me is uh, like I said already it's about as good as you're ever going to get it to be. And uh, I also think this is far superior than what's offered in uh, a uh, freelance site because one, the company doesn't know you. And in fact, the bigger companies, they don't even care whether you have an account. Why would they? <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and see, Darkland allows you to get back to what was traditional human uh, relationships. It's not faceless, impersonal organizations that dictate what you're going to do and how you're going to behave, which to me, well, it pisses me off to no end that I've got this corporation telling me what's acceptable behavior. I, I can't 
imagine why I would want to let them dictate what was the acceptable behavior. I mean, come on, I don't have the most sterling reputation as far as how to behave in the world, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. Hey, I, I hate to do this while we're broadcasting, but I got to go doorbell. <laughs> okay. I'll be right back. No problem. No problem. Uh, Sorry, it's my son at the door. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. No problem at all. Um, so I, I did think of one thing while, while you, were, you were talking about the, the circle web of trust is, and I guess why it's superior versus uh, you know, a ratings and review system, especially on a decentralized network, is that, um, I mean, if there's no centralized, you know, if there's no central party to um, you know, prevent spam, um, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and obviously on dark lands, we want the ratings and reviews to be uh, legitimate, and uh, I think I talked about this in a white paper. But there's there's going to be, a, a, I guess, a, kind of the conceptual mm -hmm. model is um, that there will be pub moderators who will um, verify that the rating ratings and reviews are accurate. Um, they'll check, um, you know, the uh, the transaction address on the Bitcoin blockchain. They'll say, okay, yep, that was completed, mm -hmm. and then they'll add it, add that, you know, they'll they'll accept that as valid, rep valid, uh, you know, valid, valid reputation. Um, but with, but we'll just say that like that, that, that is, that isn't there. Um, but a problem could be that, uh, you know, there, there could be a lot of, uh, um, fake, you know, ratings and reviews that could lead to fraud, uh, and coercion. So, um, yeah. I think the, this, the circle web of trust, um, does kind of, does kind of, uh, help, help to prevent that. But thankfully we've got a, a backup mechanism there, which well, thank, uh, thank you, Mark Wood for, for all the work you did on MetaMarket. Uh, even though it's uh, you know it never it never really took off, but I'm glad we get to to utilize some of those uh, really important um, models that that he came up with um, or that he he implemented, um, like the trustless multi-sig es es yeah. escrow and and all that. I mean, that's the the what what he was able to 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 configure there is uh, pretty pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And I do I do think that there will be people who try to game the system. That's that's a constant. But that's going to become costly to them. And I think it's too easy for us to bar people. Um, I, I do think we'll need to have, like in anything, some discipline to administer our guilds. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I definitely and agree. If, and I think if, I, if I'm a guild. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. If I'm a guild master, and before I'll let buyers come in, I have to either have them referred by a friend I trust, or I have to know them myself. Right. How difficult is it going to be for that buyer to come into my guild and start soliciting from the people that I know in my development guild? It's going to be mm -hmm. very hard because I'm a gatekeeper. Like, right. I'm not, I'm not going to let you come in here. I don't know who you are. Give me a referral of someone I know. Now, this is inefficient. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in terms of the freelance sites gather thousands of buyers and thousands of uh, sellers. And the idea is that by doing it that way, you create more opportunities. And that's quote unquote efficient. But in the process, you end up squashing of the developers or the uh, the freelancers, mm -hmm. the sellers, because who who's going to be dictating this? The guy that's paying the budget is going to be dictating, not the freelancer who's accepting the payment. And in fact, the freelancer's going to get screwed because the freelance site's going to carve out ten or twenty or twenty five percent of their pay and call it well. This is our cut, our protection money. We protect you from bad buyers. <laughs> we have our support staff, right? Well, my experience is that they don't really protect me from bad buyers so much. I mean, if I'm not protecting myself already 
which let me tell you, there is a protocol you really should go through whenever you freelance. Document everything you do every day. Because the only way that the support staff is ever going to even consider protecting you is if you followed every one of their guides to the letter and they can't find something that you screwed up on and you have a document trail for everything you did for the client. Mm -hmm. If you can't show any proof that you did work, they're going to side with the client and they're going to give the client a refund and they're going to penalize you. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't experienced this myself, but I, I guess it was kind of a warning from, from other freelancers who utilize these platforms kind of along the same lines that um, I guess one of the risks, yeah, one, of, one of the risks is that uh, you do all the work for the client and uh, you never get paid for it um, in and, and one way or another. And that's a, that's a bad deal. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a really bad deal. And, as, uh, and I, I, I guess I wasn't aware. I guess maybe I just hadn't thought of how these, uh, how I guess that element of how these sites are organized, and obviously they're, yeah, it's, it makes sense they, they kind of side with uh, the one, you know, the one bringing the money to the platform, right? Um, they're the ones, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. um, making the, uh, the 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 payments. So I, I guess that that does kind of make sense. Uh, that that definitely does make sense. Um, but yeah, hope, yeah, I I I, I certainly uh, I'm certainly excited for Darklands. Um, you know when it's when it when it comes. And I guess another a question people might be asking is, well, uh, can I can I download this now? Can I start trying it out? Um, unfortunately, not yet. Um, we are. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, right. Go ahead. No, no, I, I just I was agreeing. <laughs> yeah, right, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, I mean, we, we've, we've, we've done a lot. I mean, this has been yeah, 13 months in the, yeah, 13 months in the making. And I mean, I guess in, in total, um, I guess the development of this idea and what we're in kind of honing in on what we're going to, to, to build. Um, we've got a, a very, very good, um, plan. Uh, you can, like I said, you can check out the white paper, tinyurl.com forward slash darklands white paper. And, uh, I mean, yeah, take, take a read through it. I mean, there's, as, as you said, Matthew, it, and I, I would know this firsthand, but I've heard from plenty of people that, uh, you really only know how you like you, you it's, it's hard to put a timetable, like even when you start development on when something's going to be released, cause you don't know what bugs you're going to run into. You don't know, um, if you don't know what problems are going to arise. Uh, and I guess on that note, cause we, we did talk about, uh, the, uh, internet invisibility project I2P, um, how difficult do you think that'll be to implement? Um, I, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's being worked on, right? Um, already by the Scuttlebutt community. Uh, you know, I think there is already integrations in the uh, Scuttlebutt community to I2P. But Mark Wood was saying that it wasn't really that big of a deal to do. He had integrated BitMessage, which is another anonymous private uh, messaging system into I2P several years ago. He said it wasn't really that big of a deal to do. Okay, cool, cool. And, and and I mean, obviously, like I with, with Scuttlebutt with all the with all the encryption, you know, the, the public uh, public key crypt cryptography. I mean, it's probably not absolutely necessary to go over I2P, but why the hell not? Is kind of how I think about it. And plus, there 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 are side mm -hmm. there are side benefits to all these things. Like with Content Safe, uh, you setting it, you're, you trying to you working with uh, the folks from Freedoms Phoenix to um, kind of uh, start integrating stuff on IPFS. Um, that helps the entire network. It helps you. It helps them. It helps everybody. Um, and if we, you know, take the extra time and develop, you know, take the extra time and effort to uh, run uh, Darklands over I2P, um, that helps with I2P too. Because uh, I, 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 and I, I don't know it too familiarly, honestly. Or yeah, I don't know. I'm not too familiar with it. Um, I haven't used it a whole lot. But um, I think one of the problems with it is that there just aren't a whole lot of uh, I2P nodes out there, right? And if uh, every Darklands client is an I2P node. Mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That that is what we need. It with I I two P and IPFS, we need that. In fact, you know, we should probably offline get all your documents set up on I I, I F, IPFS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that way we could turn around and do another show on what it was like to set up all your documents on IPFS. Right. Um, and you mean like all the all the podcasts? I mean, yeah, all the article, like basically everything on yeah. IPFS, right? Um, yeah. You, that's... you know, all the stuff, but I, I'm hosting, you know, Shane's stuff mm -hmm. uh, for him, his websites and his files. I'd like to see all those files replicated over in 
I2P, excuse me, not I2P, I, IPFS. Right. Uh, I think that that would be fantastic. Uh, and, you know, it's not that hard. Do, do you have uh, anywhere that you could have internet online all the time? Um, that's something I'm working on. Um, yeah, for those who may not be aware, I, I you know, rec- I guess, yeah, recently is a couple months ago, uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, I live uh, in a homestead out in the middle of nowhere and, uh, I will, um, it has, I've been using hotspots for the past two months. It's been fine. Um, but I will be getting, uh, it's the same satellite internet that I'm broadcasting over now, still out in the middle of nowhere, but had to go to a uh, family friend's house, um, to use it. Um, so I will, yeah, I will, uh, you know, here in the next month or so. Um, when I get around to it, have uh, internet all the time. Um, it's not going to be the fastest. And it gets like 12 megabytes per second is, is average uh, for, for download. That's okay. That's, uh, what we would do, though, is pan those things to remote servers, and that the speed would actually be on the remote server, but the uh, original repository would be on your machine. Uh, okay. Very cool. Very cool. So that, so I would, I would have, I mean, uh, obviously you would, you would have, uh, you'd have, you still, um, have it, have it hosted, but I would have all of yep. my, yep. all of my files locally, all of my podcasts, all my video, everything. Yes. That's and see, that was Ernest's point at, at Freedom's Phoenix. His point was he doesn't want anyone to control his data. Sure. He wants to control his own data. He said, he doesn't mind if other people rebroadcast it. That's okay. But he doesn't want them to be able to shut him down. If someone decides not to share it, he just goes and finds someone else who wants to share it. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. And that's what we're doing now. That's what we're doing now. Uh, is I'm actually sharing his stuff. Um, and But I, I'll be talking with him tomorrow. Okay. And hopefully I'll get some decisions on, you know, what, what how we're going to move forward with his IPFS stuff. Because that we need to develop the infrastructure to rebroadcast from IPFS. And there's a few different ways that could be done. Uh, and I imagine that there would be, I, I'm going to always tell people if they want to use IPFS, host it yourself and then let us pull from it. That way you own your data because that IPFS doesn't do you a heck of a lot of good if, you, if you're divorcing yourself from the ownership of your data. Right. Uh, I suppose we could offer pinning for people who don't have dedicated internet uh, connections, but I would also tell them figure out how to get a dedicated internet connection. Uh, right. Yes. So, so I guess what? Yeah. So, I, I guess one question that 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 comes up is so if if I, I if I um, or I guess kind of more more so when uh, so when I do um, I guess um, I guess have copies of all my all my own stuff would I would I then be an IPFS node for people to uh, t- w- w- is that yes. how it works? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And what we would do is we would pin it on our side so that if you're offline, our nodes can pick up whenever you're offline. Ah, okay. Very cool. Yeah. But I, all I, 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 cer- I certainly think, uh, as, as far as the crypto anarchism series, uh, definitely need to do episodes on that. Um, because it's at some point, I don't know, I don't know when, um, and, and maybe we'll have to start another series first. Cause I, yeah, I'm not sh- sure how quick it's going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, setting up lightning nodes and, uh, uh, you know, setting up yeah. a Bitcoin full node and doing all those sorts of things to people how, how to do it. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see when that well, happens. You know, at present, I, I have some, uh, company projects that we're talking to people who want to set up things like that to, to collect payments. So I'm going to be needing excuses to become completely knowledgeable about how all these things work. There you go. Awesome. And, and it, you know, it, 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 it cross feeds, man. It always cross feeds. You, you can pick up all sorts of information uh, because of free projects you do. You know, one of the things I tell people about, say, freelancing is if you wanted to go out and learn something, right? Why not go to a freelance site and offer to do something you actually don't know how to do, but you want to learn how to do? (laughs) Right? Yeah. And offer a low price, not because you you want to be undercutting other people, but because you recognize that you're going to have to learn how to do it. Offer them the price. They they grab these guys are so tempted by the low hanging fruit. If you know that you can deliver the product, 
beat them out on price. Teach yourself how to do it and get a good review because you did it well. And then ratchet yourself up from there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's certainly certainly good advice. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So, um, yeah, we, we, I guess we've been going for an hour and a half, maybe a little a little shorter than than we than I guess what we what we kind of planned on. But um, I, ah, it's okay. Man. You got to watch out for those killer deer. <laughs> yeah, well, I, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, on my on my way back from Texas, um, uh, yeah, two months ago, yeah, I was I, I made the entire like uh fourteen hour journey, and I did it in like one 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 drive. I left at five p.m. Um, and, uh, I made it all, I made it within 10 minutes of the house and it hit a deer. Uh, so yeah, it just, oh, you're kidding, man. all that distance and you hit a deer 10 minutes from your house. Yeah. It's, it was, it was funny, funny how it worked out. Uh, but, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so bad luck. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. But, uh, so, so, so Darklands, uh, um, I, I guess we should put out a call for, um, I mean, uh, uh, you, yeah, like I said, you can go uh, view the white paper. I'll put that link in the show notes. I've said it a bunch of times so far. I'll put a link to the website in the show notes, and I'll put a link to the Discord in the show notes. Uh, that's been a little. I mean, it's 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 kind of we kind of hit a lull in the project. I think pe- people got people got busy. Um, people got real busy. So, um, but this is it's a it's a passion project. So we we've got other things to do. We've got to, we've got to make yes. money and all, and and that's 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 how it is. I mean, yeah, we don't have a bunch of venture mm-hmm. capitalists funding. We don't have a team of a hundred developers. Um, actually, we have a we have a team of a, a couple few developers right now, and we need uh um we you know, we 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 certainly uh, appreciate uh, you know help in bringing this into fruition quicker. So if you're interested, um, check the link in the show notes for uh, the link to the Discord channel. Come in there. Uh, chat you got any ideas you see a flaw in our in our uh, design in the white paper let us know uh, you know this is an open source project sure. we want to build up this community and uh, uh, yeah we we and I certainly want some some great people on board to, to help us build it absolutely man I I know that working with uh, with with mark has been a complete pleasure and he's just like me he's got work he's got to do and totally understand why he he uh, he has had to not contribute as much as he was. And I'm in the same boat. I've been spending the last six months uh, stabilizing and building this content safe. And once we have content safe with say a few hundred uh, subscribers, then it's gonna change my game. I can hire more uh, staff and I'll have more time to participate in passion projects. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, so I guess uh, I'll, I'll, I guess we'll, we'll kind of do this. Uh, um, do this. Oh gosh, and we didn't even get to. We've got another subject to cover, man. I forgot all about it. I yeah. I was Which one do we want? To yeah, uh, the Philippines being a good place to volunteer or not. Um, if people well, are interested, we, we in did per- talk. Uh, maybe we have a separate show about that. But I, I think um, what I can do is um, uh, talk a little bit. Um, about that for just five minutes. Um, I mean, we could do. I mean, yeah, we we could do another. Uh, hell, you uh, know, be good to have another excuse to get together, get together and chat. So yeah, yeah, I want to do a, a second episode on that and really, uh, you know, maybe spend an hour in full uh, going through uh, um, all sorts of uh, details sure. for that. Cool. Sure. I, you know, my 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 two minute you know overview of that uh, is there are two ways to do it. One way is marry a native, probably optimal. Because if you marry a native, uh, you can get uh, a a continuous access visa. It's called a 13A. And you don't have any overhead for paying for tourist visas. You you pay $5 roughly a year to to just report that, that you've been a good person and you haven't burned any buildings down or anything like that. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, they don't they don't really they used to harass you a lot like back in the 90s I went through a lot of it's really a pain you know with the immigration and all that but things have improved and they don't really harass people as much anymore uh, if you do the other option which is just come on a tourist visa they're pretty liberal I think it's 60 or 90 days on the passport and then you go and get a visa after that. So I know guys that they do that continuously year round. Yeah. That they just stay on a tourist visa all the time. 
And then there's the third option for the really the people who have chutzpah, which is come and don't ever register and just stay. And if you're going to do that, I know people who've done it. Just be circumspect. Don't get involved in anything that would get you in the crosshairs of the police. Don't get involved in anything. And I know guys. I know a guy who's been here 30 years. Never had a problem with immigration in 30 years. Uh, but he keeps his he keeps his nose clean, so to use an idiom. Uh, he doesn't get involved in anything that would get him in anybody's crosshairs. Stay out of politics. But a, a good Vanuan won't get involved in politics in the first place, right? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, they're, they're escaping politics if they're going to the Philippines or China or anywhere else, really, right? Um, they're escaping the U.S. Yeah, politics yeah. or wherever they're coming from. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so that that's my uh, that's my two minute overview. But you can talk about a lot more because there are a lot of benefits in coming here. Like Mexico has like ninety percent of their economy is black. The Philippines is just the same. But again, you're going to need a guide. You're going to need someone who knows what the local economy is like and how to navigate. Because just like Mexico, I'm sure never. I went to Mexico once when I was 13, and I only stayed for an afternoon. But uh, I'm sure Mexico is the same. If you don't get the right people to deal with, they'll steal you blind. Yeah, they'll 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 exploit you. Yeah, yes. As, as soon as as yeah. soon as uh, me and Henzi got there, I mean, he knew he, they have their local their local um, Acapulco contact, and he just kind of he helps helps the uh, the expats and the the travelers out. So that's. Yep. That's how it works out, and then they get a little, um, they get a little cut for helping out. It's good for everybody. Um, it's good for everybody. So, um, yeah, we'll definitely have to cover that in, in more detail because I, I do have a lot of questions. Um, but uh, I guess just as we sure. conclude, um, uh, any closing thoughts you leave for the listeners on uh, Darklands to start? Uh, you know, read our white, read our white paper. Let's let's try to dialogue about this. We do have a Discord channel that we can talk about it. I, I occasionally watch that. If we had more, you know, chatter going on there, then uh, we could perhaps synergize and come up with some more ideas. I would like us to keep the paradigm as simple as possible because I do believe a simple set of uh, rules will will evolve into something extremely complicated and robust. Mm-hmm. That's my thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And uh, content safe. Uh, uh, any closing thoughts on that? Make sure to, to, to plug away. Uh, let people know, uh, I guess, your, your, your closing pitch. And uh, also, I uh, suppose, yeah, where, where people can learn more about uh, what you guys are offering. If you're a content creator and you want to know more about it, contact me. Uh, my email address is matthew.rainer at contentsafe.co. Let's talk. Uh, if you are a small content creator, that's great. You know what? Let's just talk about uh, maybe interviewing me on a podcast. Maybe you don't want to, maybe you can't afford to do it, don't publish enough, but maybe you know people who are larger uh, content creators. I'm working now presently on getting interviews with people so that I can get the word out about the service. Uh, I will also be coordinating with, uh, it looks like I'll be coordinating with Richard Grove. Uh, we might be trying to raise either crowdfunding or maybe some investors. Awesome. Yeah. Love, love Richard. Uh, um, if uh, my listeners haven't checked out his work, uh, tragedyandhope.com and, and uh, Peace Revolution podcast. There's a, a free plug for him because his work is just absolutely terrific. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to hear that, uh, you know, you'll be, you'll be uh, dialoguing with him and, and maybe working something out. That's, that's absolutely great to hear. Uh, he's got a lot of connections. He's been doing this for a long time. He's one of the uh, the oldest uh, the oldest ones that I know of. I think he's been doing it since 2006. So he's yep. got a lot of content, um, a lot of content, and a lot of connections in the uh, in the alternative media. So um, that's great to hear. Definitely go check out the website, guys. At, at the very least, go check it out. And uh, I will put links. I'll put a link to uh, Matthew's email in the show notes. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, other than that, I guess just any overall closing thoughts for the listeners that you like to uh, to leave them with. Uh, no, I think that that's uh, pretty much it. I look forward to talking more on Banu uh, to you and to your audience. And I want to, them to understand that the whole premise of Content Safe is a Banu and idea. 
and awesome. yeah, yeah. And l- let's uh, let's just try to make everyone uh, let's empower people. Let's empower people. I love it. Love it. Um, well, Matthew, thank you so much for for coming on the podcast. Uh, it was a great, great conversation. Highly valuable. Covered a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, great stuff. Um, and also, uh, thank you for the listeners for uh, tuning into the Bonnie podcast. Uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, beginning of the episode, please do consider checking out uh, Liberty Under Attack Publications uh, for all your self liberational media resources. Just visit libertyunderattack.com to browse our selection and use coupon code SELF LIBERATE for 10% off. Uh, and also, uh, Jason and I released a two and a half hour Patreon ep- uh, Patreon exclusive episode recently. Uh, we ran through all sorts of subjects, and uh, I think you'll enjoy the un- uh, the unedited, uh, unplanned conversation. Uh, we didn't know what we were going to talk about when we went into it, but it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, to get access to that, just visit patreon.com forward slash Fonu uh, for just two dollars a month, uh, and we we certainly appreciate all that all the support uh, so far on there. And uh, for those who are going to hop on board, uh, uh, we certainly we certainly do appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, that's all, folks, and uh, we will talk soon. Okay, bye-bye. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption, ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, Please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon.